studying about the uh, times in the Bible and we had looked at various times that the Bible talks about like times past, times of ignorance, times of visitation, times of reformation uh, and also uh, today we are going to look at, uh, we also looked at the times of the Gentiles. Today we are going to look at what the Bible says about the latter times. Alright, so this is very relevant to us because we are a part of these latter times and I can say that 2021 for the whole world did not begin on a very good note. You know the reason for that? Well, one of the reasons is because somebody out there is trying to wipe out millions of people in this world, trying to reduce the population of this world. <clears throat> and uh, it looks like they're devising new and innovative means uh, to achieving that end. Last year we had this whole thing about this virus and of course it did kill a few people but uh, now they say there is a new form of that virus coming out which is going to kill more number of people and of course they are also like I've said finding out new methods uh, to kill people and uh, now they're talking about a vaccination. So all these things do not look good but you see the Christian is not taken by surprise when he sees how soon things or situations in this world change because this book that we have has already warned us about all these things that are coming upon this world so we are not uh, surprised <clears throat> we are not caught off guard at all because we have been expecting these things and these sudden changes that we see in the world are things that the bible has already warned us about now you know that, of course, for many of you, uh, Christians especially, uh, you're good Christians, you're just satisfied by reading the Bible. You don't want to look at anything else, which is very good. You must read the Bible. You must first come to the Bible for an understanding of everything. But then when you also look at the situation in the world, whether it is this so-called pandemic or even the political situation. Take for example what's happening in the United States of America. For some of you that may not at all look significant, but it is, it is very very significant. Whether you believe that the United States is pictured in type in the Bible or not, it does play a very important role in these last days that we are living in. And I can tell you that everything that we see in this world is pointing towards just one end and that is the coming world ruler the Antichrist and the coming one world government and one world religion but you see for the born-again Christian all this points to another very great and important fact the rapture of the church uh, many many Christians in the last few days have uh, brought to my attention this book I guess which was written by uh, somebody I think in America or England somewhere uh, this uh, Christian Bible teacher's name is Bishore and he had written a book predicting that is 10 years ago that the rapture would be in 2021 I did not read that book <clears throat> I have no clue what his arguments are but you see, everybody is talking about the end of the world. Everybody is talking, if it's Christians, all the preachers are talking about the rapture of the church. Like never before, we see an unprecedented rise in preaching on the rapture of the church since last year. That's because Christians can sense times have changed very quickly and very, very soon. Things are going to get worse, but praise God, we are going to be out. We are going to be out of this world. Well, we might have to face some of these troubles that are coming of, you know, upon this world. We might have to taste a little bit of uh, those things that are coming. But eventually we will be out. We will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And we praise God for that. But as born again Christians, it is good for us to discern the signs of the times. And it is good for us to uh, keep ourselves abreast of the world situation. Take for example what's happening in the Middle East. Iran is getting ready for a war against Israel. It's almost threatening Israel every day. Israel is ready with its nuclear submarines and other things to attack Iran. Jesus said, remember there will be wars and rumors of wars. 
there already was taking place in the Middle East. You have uh, the war going on in Syria, where so many countries are involved, like Iran and Russia and the United States, Israel. All these countries are involved in this war. And on the other side, there is this whole talk about peace going on. This Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and now Qatar. All these countries trying to become friends with Israel especially. Remember what Paul said when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction cometh upon them. Brethren, things are changing way too fast for us to uh, think that, oh, everything's the same. You know, preachers have been talking about the rapture for many, many years now. You cannot take it so lightly. The time is at hand. Therefore, it's good for us to know what's happening because what's happening has what has already been prophesied and predicted in the Bible. So when you read your Bible and when you read the news or when you watch the news or when you look at what's happening in the world today, you know the next great event in God's calendar is the rapture of the church. Now turn with me please in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. We will read verses 1 to 3. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 to 3. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Now in this passage, Paul talks about the latter times and that's what we are going to look at today. The latter times. What are these latter times? As I've said, we certainly have something to do with these latter times. Now, you need to understand that these latter times are not limited to the last days that Paul talks about in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. Those last days in 2 Timothy 3 1 are a reference to the very last days in the Laodicean church period just before the rapture of the church. And the last days of 2 Timothy 3 1 are a part of these latter times that Paul is talking about in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. <clears throat> These latter times are a reference to the church age that follows the completion of the apostolic age and the completion of the New Testament around AD 90. All right. This church that we are, or this period that we are talking about is... The, the beginning of this is around AD 90, let's say, that's when the book of Revelation was finished, the last book of the New Testament. So this latter time, these latter times begin with roughly AD, around AD 90, and it continues throughout the church age. And I'm going to show you why I say that. The reason why we say that these latter times are not limited to the time period just before the rapture of the church but they encompass the entire church age because Paul gives us the characteristics of these last times and he mentions uh, certain things which are not limited to these last times or to, or to these last days that are there before the rapture of the church. Let's say this is the rapture of the church. And this is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the last days of 2 Timothy, chapter 3 and verse 1, are these. These are the last days. Of course, we are living in these last days right now, just before the rapture of the church. But the latter times, as I've said, are not limited at all to these last days, but they encompass the entire church age the entire church age and the reason for that the characteristics that Paul gives for these latter times are a reference to the condition of Christians throughout the church age and they're not just limited to these last days last days 
So I hope you are able to follow what I'm saying here. The latter times are a reference to the entire church because the characteristics of these latter times match not just the last days but the entire church age. And we are going to look at that. Look at what Paul says uh, in these verses that we have just said. He's talking about the characteristics of these latter times. And he mentions that he's and these seven things are not limited to the last days we are living in right now, the 20th century. But of course, all these seven or so characteristics Paul mentions are especially true of these last days. No doubt about that. But they are also a reference to the entire church. Let me show you that. He says, the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the first. That's the first thing. Some shall depart from the faith. That is not something that is limited to the last days. People have departed from the faith. Of course, this is not a word for apostasy. Apostasy. The second thing he says is that they give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Seducing spirits. Again, this is not something that is limited to the last days. It's more so in these last days, but this existed throughout the church age. These are the latter times. The entire church age. Doctrines of devils. The fourth one is speaking lies and hypocrisy. People have been speaking lies not just in these last days but throughout the church age. Speaking lies and hypocrisy is a reference to the preaching and teaching of God's word. Conscience seared with a hot iron. Conscience seared with a hot iron forbidding to marry now this becomes a little more clear forbidding to marry I wonder who it is that forbids people from getting married do you know any church or denomination that forbids people from getting married or which commands people to abstain from meats, do you know of any? I know one. It's called the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church. All these characteristics can be found in one church and that is the Roman Catholic Church. Departing from the faith, seducing spirits, doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, uh, the conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry like they do with their priests, abstain from meats like they have these practices of abstaining from meats at certain times like on Fridays or during Lent period or certain other times. All these can be found in the Roman Catholic Church. So this great apostasy is to do not just with these last days that we are living in, that we are here now, but it's a reference to the entire church period because the Roman Catholic Church existed right from the beginning. And I'm going to show you that. Brethren, you must understand this. If you are wondering why it is that some Bible-believing preachers go all out against the Roman Catholic Church, it's because they know that the greatest enemy of souls on the earth today in physical form is the Roman Catholic Church. It's not communism, it's not socialism, all those things are bad, no doubt. But it's the Roman Catholic Church. It's not Freemasonry either, because Roman, the, the Roman Catholic Church is behind Freemasonry. This is the mother of all harlots and abominations of the earth. Never forget that. 
and a preacher who refuses to expose this whore for who she is, is not doing what God has called him to do. If you look at the preaching of the reformers from the time of the Reformation in the 16th century, every single reformer would refer to the Roman Catholic Church as the Antichrist and the Pope also as the Antichrist. And they recognized that the Roman Catholic Church is indeed the bride of Satan, the bride of the devil. And they exposed it. A preacher who refuses to speak against this is either uh, uh, you know, too blind to realize the truth or he's too afraid to offend this great abominations of the earth and the mother of harlots. Never trust a preacher or a teacher who uh, speaks well of the Roman Catholic Church. You cannot read the Bible and still believe that this is just another denomination. You cannot. And if you do, you are in that great deception of these last days that many Christians are under. They think, oh, you do not have love if you speak against the Catholic Church. Or you are bringing seditions. You are such a divisive person. You are full of hatred and all that nonsense. Don't care. Don't bother. This mother of harlots and abominations of the earth is the enemy of God and the enemy of the souls of mankind. Go back and read Revelation 17 and 18. You will understand that. And that's why it's important. And Paul exposes it. And remember that the mystery of iniquity was already working in the days of Paul. The, the seeds of the Roman Catholic Church and its teachings and doctrines were already sown in the very beginning, even during the days of the Apostles. The Apostle John speaks about it in his epistles. The Apostle Paul speaks about the mystery of iniquity. The Apostle John says, there are many antichrists. <coughs> and as I've said, the seeds were already sown. Later on, uh, the, the, you start seeing the actual tree growing up in the church age. That woman who took a little leaven and leavened the whole lump. Right? That began. The leavening began right in the beginning, in the days of the apostles themselves. So these latter times that we are talking about are the last days of this world that is the church age. Remember in a previous Bible study I have shown you how Many Bible teachers teach that the last days began at the cross. Now that's wrong. You must rightly divide the word of truth. The last days are not the same as the latter times. In the Bible, you need to look carefully. Latter times is a reference to the entire church age, whereas the last days did not begin in the, uh, at the time of the cross and continue and will end with the rapture. That's not true. The last days were there when Christ was there on the earth, but since the kingdom was rejected by Israel, the last days were postponed to the future. And again, we are in the last days just before the rapture of the church and the beginning of the tribulation. So you must rightly divide the word of truth. Last days and latter times. The last days are a part of these latter times and we are living in the last days. And the last days are not limited to this time period before the rapture of the church. The last days are a reference to the entire tribulation period before the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, looks like there is some trouble with uh, my voice. Yeah, I can see that. I'm sorry there's nothing much I can do about it. Just pray and uh, ask the Lord to help us to be able to go forward. Looks like there's something wrong with uh, the internet. It always happens. Nowadays it always happens. It doesn't happen the whole day. Right when we start teaching, this problem begins. Uh, so these latter times are, are not limited to the last days, but the last days are a part of these latter times that we are talking about. This is a reference to the entire church age. Now, you must remember that the Bible primarily is a historical book. Never forget that. The Bible is a history book, not a religious book. It gives you the history of this world, right from the beginning to the end. The Bible is a history book, 
and it is history sometimes written in advance. It records past history. It also records future history. And you must keep that in mind when you read the Bible. In fact, I want to tell you this, that in the Bible, you have a complete history of the 7,000 years of mankind. A complete history. In fact, it gives you a little bit uh, more information as well about times before the creation of this world. Uh, the Bible gives us a glimpse into what happened before the creation of this world. So the Bible is a history book. It records the history of this world from the beginning to the end. In Genesis chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2. Genesis chapter 1 verses 1 and 2. You have a history of the world that then was. The world that then was. Now you see that this is how Clarence Larkin divides, rightly divides the word of truth. This is not something that I have come up with. This is Clarence Larkin's division of uh, the ages of this earth. So the world that then was, you read about it in 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 5 and 6. Let's quickly read that. 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 5 and 6. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. This is not a reference to Noah's flood. It is not. Hopefully now this, this problem with the video and audio not syncing uh, should be gone. That's the notification I have got. So I just pray that you are able to watch and listen at the same time. So the world that then was is a reference to the original creation of Genesis 1.1. Which God destroyed in chapter 1 verse 2 of Genesis because of the rebellion of Lucifer and his angels. That's another subject that uh, you know is very interesting to study. Some Christians don't believe that. They think we are teaching this. They call it the gap theory. It's not a theory, my friend. It's a fact. In fact, uh, a very dear brother, a Bible-believing preacher and teacher and missionary to Ukraine has written a beautiful tract called The Gap Fact. And if you can get a hold of it, you should read it. It's a wonderful little booklet. Uh, and he proves conclusively that it's not a theory that the Bible states or Bible-believing preachers talk about. It's a fact that there is a gap between Genesis 1.1 and 1.2. Now many Christians think we teach that to accommodate millions of years for the earth to please the scientists. Believe me, that's the last thing we would try to do. We do not believe in uh, uh, this uh, thing. I, I, you know, I don't uh, read these kind of things anymore so these words escape my memory. But you call this some kind of an evolution where God is involved in it, right? I'm sure you get the word. It's gone from my mind. So we don't believe in that. We don't believe that God created the world or matter and then caused everything to evolve. We don't believe in evolution in any form. And we are not trying to accommodate the theory of evolution. Now evolution is a theory. Unproven, unscientific. But the, f the fact is that there is a gap between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2 and it's important doctrinally for us to understand that. That's why we keep repeating that so much. If the devil blinds you in Genesis 1, 1, God help you with the rest of the Bible. So Genesis 1, 1 is the world that then was. Then in Genesis 1, 3, you have the heavens and the earth which are now. Once again in 2 Peter chapter 3. Verse 7, but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The earth that we are living in today is the earth which now is, right? The heavens and the earth which are now. Heavens and earth which are now this is Genesis 1 3 so here you have 
Genesis 1 2, the gap. Not theory, gap fact. The gap, is, the gap is a fact, whether you believe it or not, whether you like it or not, whether you don't like me teaching it or not, that's the fact. Genesis 1 1, the world which then was destroyed, not by Noah's flood, but by the great flood of Genesis 1 2. And then Genesis 1 3, the heavens and earth which are now. All right, so you see that how uh, the Bible gives us a clear history of this world, not just uh, the future or just the Old Testament history, but right from the beginning, right from the very, very beginning. And then, of course, in Revelation 21, uh, verses 1 and 2, the Bible talks about the new heavens and the new earth, right? The new heaven and the new earth. That'll be at the end of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. That's yet future. After 7,000 years, this present earth is renovated by fire and God makes a new earth and a new heaven. Look at 2 Peter again, chapter 3 and verse 13. Nevertheless, we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Complete history of this world. From the beginning to the end. Everything is recorded in the Bible. From Genesis chapter 1, of course, <coughs> right up till uh, the time of, let's say, Nehemiah or Malachi, you have the Old Testament. You have the Old Testament and the entire history of the Old Testament is given from Genesis 1-3 to Malachi chapter 4. Of course, Malachi is there in the times of Nehemiah or 2 Chronicles around that time. And then in, uh, there is a gap, of course, of 400 years called the silent years or the intertestamental period, as some would like to call it. It's about 400 years. The history of this period also is covered in the Bible. In Daniel chapter 2, for example, in the uh, dream that Nebuchadnezzar saw, he saw a history of all the world powers of the Old Testament as well as the New Testament times, right? So he covers a bit of history in Daniel 2 and then a detailed history of the intertestamental period is found in Daniel chapter 11. And you must understand this when I say that a detailed information about the situation in these 400 years is recorded in Daniel 11. The things recorded in Daniel 11 are not limited to those 400 years. The Bible and prophecy in Bible in the Bible has double application. All right, sometimes it has a present application as well as a future application. Okay, never forget that. If you forget this law of double application, you'll get messed up in your understanding of the scriptures. So you have a, an, an entire history of the Old Testament given in the Bible. Then you come to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Gospels, and then the book of Acts. You come to around 60 AD. Around 60 AD. And then you have the Apostle John living right up till 90 AD. And the, almost this entire period is covered in the New Testament. And what is not covered in the Gospels and in the book of Acts is covered in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapters 2 and 3 as we are going to look at that's going to be our focus uh, this evening as we study this these latter times in this church age we're going to look at Revelation 2 and 3 and the seven messages to the seven churches there but they are a description of the condition of the church for 2000 years. Remember the Bible has a doctrinal application, it has uh, a prophetical application, a doctrinal application, it has a historical application, and it has a spiritual application. Never forget that. If you do not see that, the Bible can be applied in three different ways, then again you get messed up in your understanding of the scriptures. Revelation chapters 2 and 3, uh, three, the seven messages to the seven churches of Asia, in type, are, are talking about the entire church age. Historically, they are talking to seven churches in John's time. 
around 90 AD. Doctrinally, they are a reference to churches in the tribulation. But you see, spiritually or even prophetically, we can say it's a reference to the entire church age. And once you look at that, you will see that the Bible covers the history of this whole world. Don't think the Bible stops talking about the history of this world with around, uh, the uh, you know, death of John the Apostle around 90 or 180. No, the Bible doesn't stop talking about history there. It continues. It talks about the history of this world for 2000 years. It talks about the tribulation. It talks about the millennial reign of Christ. It talks about the new heavens and the new earth. The Bible is a history book. And in Revelation 2 and 3, as I have said, we are given the conditions that existed in the church in these latter times. And that is the last 2000 years of this church age. They are given to us in some detail, as I have said in Revelation 2 and 3. And before we look at that, once again, let us go back to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and take a closer look at a couple of things that I have written down here. Departing from the faith and seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Let us look at these things because the other things we know very well what they are talking about. Like speaking lies and hypocrisy, conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, abstaining from meats. Those things are very clear. But what is Paul say, uh, uh, talking about when he says that some will depart from the faith and listen to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils? And let us see how these three things are true and characteristic of these latter times, the entire church age. Firstly, he says that some will depart from the faith. Now, of course, in the Greek, uh, the word depart there is apost uh, apostasio, I guess. I'm not, if, uh, if, uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken. It is the word from which we get the English word apostasy. And it means to depart from the faith. Basically, that's the meaning. And he says, they, in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. Now look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 23. Colossians 1 23. If ye continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. He talks about continuing in the faith rooted and grounded and not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard. Moving away from what you have heard and believed, departing from the faith. The faith here is to do with the common Christian faith. The whole body of truth that we have accepted in the Bible. Moving away from the truth of the Bible. How many uh, professing Christians today have openly said that they no longer believe in the things that the Bible says. They move away from the faith. They depart from the faith. Remember what Paul said uh, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, <coughs> talking about the day of Christ, that is the rapture of the church. He says, that day shall not come except they come a falling away first. Correct? That will take place in these last days just before the day of Christ. A great falling away. A great departing from the faith. A great apostasy. Moving away from the things which you have heard. The hope of the gospel. There are many Christians who are losing faith. Now, of course, the first question that would come to your mind would be, have they lost their salvation? Well, I can only say this, that if they were saved at some point in their lives, even if they renounce Christ today, they do not lose their salvation. And we do not go with the teaching of these super spiritual Christians who would say, oh, that man was never saved to begin with. As if they know whether a person is really saved or not by looking at them or looking at their behavior. You don't know their heart. God knows the heart. 
you will be surprised at how many people you will see in heaven that you never expected to be there. So never judge anybody's salvation. We can judge them in other things, but when it comes to salvation, we don't judge them. We can only hope and pray that that person at some point had really trusted Jesus Christ as his as her, or her uh, savior and was saved, was born again. And if they were, they don't lose their salvation, even if they depart from the faith. So keep that question aside. But the point is this, that many are departing from the faith. But again, like I've said, this is not just a characteristic that is limited to these last days. It's something that has happened throughout the church age. For various reasons, people have departed from the faith. But not only that, they give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, this is important because, yes, people are giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils more than ever in these last days. And that's what you see all around you among Christianity. Having itching ears, they have multiplied teachers to themselves. And according to their own desires, they have teachers. And they teach them all sorts of nonsense, anything but the Bible. And the people listen to them. They believe those lies and they do according to those lies. Where do those lies emanate from? They emanate from hell. They are doctrines of devils and seducing spirits. Of course, all the new English versions immediately pounce on this verse and try to rip it apart and say, Oh, you can't say this. It's not doctrines of devils. It's not seducing spirits. It should be something else here. Just throw all that trash aside and stick to the King James Bible. It says, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. It's happening now. But you see, it didn't begin in these last days. It began right here at the, uh, uh, the, the very early uh, apostolic church age. That's where it all started. Remember, the seeds of apostasy were sown in the days of the apostles themselves. And if you study a church history that gives you facts and not interpretations, then you will be able to see that. If you read <coughs> the standard church history book, uh, books recommended by Christian seminaries and Bible colleges, well, you will find that they are all pro-Roman Catholic. They'll never call the Roman Catholic Church out for what it is. They would make it look like the church from the days of the apostles developed and the outcome of that uh, development in the church is the Roman Catholic Church. You see, they're evolutionists. They believe everything becomes better. Can the church ever become better than what it was in the days of the apostles? Never. Never. Things don't get better. They degenerate. They become worse as years go by. And that's what happened in the church age. And now, of course, we are in the worst time in the entire church history. But you see, the, the seeds were sown in the beginning. It didn't become better. It became worse. And the Roman Catholic Church came onto the scene and spread the apostasy. Remember, uh, Matthew chapter 13, I think verse 33, if I'm not mistaken, the woman with the leaven, she leavens the whole lump. That's a reference to Mystery Babylon, the woman. Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots, leavening the whole lump. She leavens the church. Thank God for the Reformation which gave us the King James Bible which is the only book which can keep us safe from that leavening of that harlot. So you have seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. What are some of these uh, doctrines that these seducing spirits and devils have taught for 2000 years? They substitute their church for Jesus Christ. Correct? Who did that in church history? It's the Roman Catholic Church. They say there is no salvation outside the Catholic Church. What a horrible thing. If that is the truth, why do you need Jesus Christ to die on the cross and shed his blood for our atonement? If it is the church that gives salvation, you don't need Jesus Christ. Well, the Roman Catholic Church never said you need Jesus Christ for your salvation. 
They said you need the church. They say Mary was sinless. She was born sinless. I think they call it the immaculate conception of Mary. So Jesus was born sinless and Mary was born sinless. You see how they try to make Mary equal with, if not more than Jesus Christ. They call her, they make her a mediator. Just like the Bible says, Jesus Christ is the mediator between God and men. They say Mary lived a sinless life like Jesus Christ. And uh, they, they teach that Mary also was taken up to heaven just as Jesus Christ was taken up to heaven after his resurrection. They teach that Mary ha uh, has a part in the salvation of the sinner. They teach that Mary can be prayed to. She's a mediator. You want to reach God? You want to get the ear of Jesus Christ? You go through his mother. She will recommend you to her son and then her son will look favorably upon you. Blasphemies that come from hell is what have, uh, you know, the Bible calls doctrines of devils and seducing spirits. Of course, it is the Catholic Church that has taught, just like the Babylonian religion of the Old Testament times, that the priest should not marry. Contrary to what the Bible teaches, that a pastor should be married. He should be the husband of one wife. He should be married. But they say a priest should not be married. They teach celibacy of the priesthood, which is dead against what the Bible teaches. And of course they teach the baptismal regeneration of children. If you sprinkle, the priest sprinkles water on infants that those infants get saved by joining the church for a fee of course. All these blasphemous teachings have been taught for 2000 years almost by the Catholic Church and even before it was called the Roman Catholic Church these teachings were already there in the church. So called church fathers started teaching these right from the beginning immediately after the death of the Apostle John. So called church fathers started teaching uh, these doctrines of devils and seducing spirits and the Roman Catholic Church just carried those teachings forward uh, in the years to come. So they say you can sprinkle a child and that child would get saved. They say the Pope is the Holy Father. Where do they get this from? It comes straight from the Babylonian religion. The Bible doesn't uh, teach that there is an apostolic succession of priesthood of or priests. The Bible doesn't teach that. In fact, the Bible teaches us that all born again Christians are priests to God. The priesthood of believers. This forgotten doctrine was resurrected at the time of the Reformation by the great reformers. They laid a great, a great emphasis on this doctrine of the priesthood of believers. One was justification by faith. And of course you have all those solas, right? The four or five solas. And then they had this emphasis on the priesthood of all believers. And Christians should remember that because as we are going to look at, uh, I don't know if we have the time to do this today, but in the next Bible study, the Lord willing, when we look at Revelation chapters 2 and 3, you will see that the so-called doctrine of the Nicolaitans has been there in the church for the past 2000 years. And increasing low, uh, increasingly so in these last days, among the charismatic Christians, they place their pastors on a pedestal. They almost make a god out of him and worship him. Of course, now if they listen to this, they say, oh, we're talking rubbish, we don't do that. They're blind, you see, they don't see them doing that. But we can see it. So they say the Pope is the Holy Father. Holy Father to whom? Why is he holy? To whom is he a father? Why is he a father? He's not even married. How can be, uh, he be a father? Blasphemy. Jesus said, call no man your father on earth. He's talking not about your physical father. You can call him a father. Jesus Christ is uh, not a fool. 
to have said that you cannot call your own father father. So you have some of these charismatic Christians calling, uh, you know, saying that it's a sin to call your daddy your father. He, he didn't mean that. He meant in a spiritual sense or a religious sense. There is no uh, spiritual leader who can be your father. There is one father for us, God. There are pastors, there are teachers, evangelists, apostles, right? All these, but no fathers. As an office is what Jesus Christ is talking. There is no office of the father for the church. And just in opposition to that, the Catholics claim the Pope is the Holy Father. <coughs> then another doctrine of devil, they say the blood of Jesus Christ is not sufficient to cleanse you from all sin and to take you to heaven. You Christian must suffer for your sins. You will go to a place called purgatory. And there you will pay for your sins. You will suffer for your sins for millions of years, maybe or thousands of years. And then when you have fully paid for all your sins... You will go to heaven. That is again uh, a doctrine worthy of where it's come from. It's come from hell. It's worthy of hell. Thank God. I know I'm not going to pay for my sins because somebody else paid for my sins. And that is the son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. When he died on the cross for my sins, when he shed his blood, he paid for my sins. <coughs> I don't have to pay for a single sin that I've committed. He's taken my punishment upon himself. He paid it all. Like that beautiful old hymn says. He paid it all. I have nothing to pay now. I cannot pay. If I could have paid, he wouldn't have died for my sins. But he knew I couldn't have paid for my sins. That's why he shed his blood for them. He was buried. He rose up again. He paid for my sins. But you see the blasphemy of the Roman Catholic Church saying that you have to suffer for your sins in purgatory. There is no such thing as purgatory. It's nothing but uh, you know, a figment of somebody's imagination. That's all it is. It's not in the Bible. Purgatory. You know, they have just, they got so messed up reading the Bible and uh, the apocryphal books that they believe in that they came out with this doctrine of purgatory and of course they came out with it so that they could uh, put their doctrine together which does not hold without certain inclusions that they had to bring in if they don't bring in certain elements their whole body of doctrine will not stand together so some inventions had to be made to keep it together one of them is purgatory of course, all this nonsense taught in the Roman Catholic Church is nothing but doctrines of devils and seducing spirits. And it's uh, not uh, even original to the Roman Catholic Church. It all began with mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. It all began in the beginning when man turned away from God and started his own uh, way of finding God, created his own gods and worshipped them, uh, those gods that he made with his own hands. So you must understand this, that the latter times that Paul is talking about is a reference to the entire church age. And this entire church age is characterized by these things. Because you see, this church age of 2000 years is not dominated by Bible-believing Christians. Don't uh, at all be in that delusion that we Bible believing Christians have ruled the world for 2000 years. No, you were a minority, you were persecuted, you were killed for your faith, you were the obscuring of the earth, nothing but like dung, that's all you were in this world. Who dominated the world for 2000 years? It's the Roman Catholic Church. The majority of Christians established churches giving heed to the doctrines of devils and seducing spirits which come from the Roman Catholic Church. Christians, you must be careful about this. You must be very, very careful to understand the true nature of the Catholic Church because the Bible talks so much about it. In prophecy, there is so much about the Catholic Church. And for 2000 years in these latter times, from around 90 AD, 
to the rapture of the church what you see is a leavening of the church what you see is an apostasy in the church and of course it degenerates and it comes to this point where like this say you know some people like to say very soon all hell is going to break loose literally but thank God once again as I've said we'll be gone we'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air now uh, I don't know if uh, it's because I've come back after a long time that I've taken about one hour just to do the introduction but uh, the, I, I think it'd be wise for us to stop here for today because there is so much for us to learn from Revelation chapters 2 and 3 which as I've said talk about the latter times the entire church period and I'm going to show you in a little bit of detail as to what the Bible says about these latter times so we are going to close here for today but before that I just want to say this if you are an unsaved person tonight and if you are watching this I want you to know that you can get saved right now today especially in this country that I'm living in Christians every day are being accused of what they call forced conversions they say we are forcibly converting people into Christianity now if somebody has really done that they have done it so that they could accuse Christians of doing something wrong why do I say that I say this because real Christians know that they cannot convert anybody how can I convert you conversion is to do with your soul or with your spirit it's not a place where I can reach. They say, oh, they forcibly convert. How can a Christian forcibly convert someone? Tell me that. Do we do that at gunpoint or at knife point? Do you ever see that? You know it's not true. You never see a Christian doing that. You have seen people from other religions doing that here in India, but Christians have never done that. Firstly, then they say, oh, they give uh, gifts and money and uh, try to convert people. Well, you take a look at Christianity here in India. Does it look to you like a majority of Christians are rich people? You know the truth again, that the majority of Christians are in India are very, very poor people. If they have extra money, they would need it for themselves and for their families. They don't have money to give it to someone and ask them to become a Christian because they get nothing out of doing that. They know it's really uh, a very, very stupid thing to do. If you think Christians are engaged in bribing people into becoming Christians, then you're certainly uh, believed a lie. It cannot happen because even if we do that and someone claims to have converted to Christianity, we get nothing out of it nothing what do you think we get out of that if we give money to people and ask them to become Christians what do we get out of that nothing do you think there is a big conspiracy going on here that's what they are saying Christians are conspiring to turn this country into a Christian nation how, how can we do that it's not possible think logically think sensibly I appeal to your sensible mind Think about it. It's not possible. Now, I am preaching through the medium of uh, this internet. How can I give you anything to change your heart? Can you change your heart if I give you money? Will money change your heart? If it does, it tells a lot about the condition of your heart. If any man can change his mind or heart because of money, he must be, I don't know what to call such a person. It's impossible, firstly. They may profess with their mouth, but inside nothing happens. You see, that's not what Jesus Christ told us to do. The Bible never tells us to do any of these things because God is holy and righteous. He doesn't take wrong means to do the right thing. He told Christians to go and give a message to this world. That message is found in this book. And that's all we do. Give a message. 
If a person believes that message of the gospel that we preach, he gets converted, not because of me, not because of what I give him, but because he believes the truth. And that converts the soul. Faith converts the soul. How can I buy faith? I cannot. Nobody can. Can you buy faith? If you say to me today, you'd give me a million dollars if I become a Muslim, you think I would really change my mind? I might say with my mouth, yes, yes, I'm ready to do that. I've become a Muslim. I'll take the money. But my heart has it changed. Do I believe in your God really? No, I don't. It's a silly thing to say, but big political leaders are leveling these accusations against Christians. They are acting like children. So in... Uh, and, Christ, and so many people in India believe the words of these politicians, these big leaders, that Christians are either forcibly converting people into Christianity or giving them bribes and converting them into Christianity. In the Bible, only God can convert, not man. Only God can convert you. I can only, the give, uh, I can only give you the message which God can use to convert you. But I cannot convert you. I cannot give you a gift while here I'm teaching and preaching through this video or this camera. I can't, right? But I'm still trying to win your soul. Because you see, that's what my Savior Jesus Christ has commanded me to do. He said, go and preach the gospel. And we preach it. You take it if you like it. You throw it aside if you think it's rubbish. It's your choice ultimately. But the message is this, that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. And he has come down from heaven to this earth for you. You say, why did he come for me? Now the Bible says that man is a sinner. Whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, this is what the Bible says. You may get angry with me. You may get offended at what I say. But I'm just telling you what this book says, this book which I believe, it says all men are, sinner, uh, are sinners. The Bible says for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm not saying you are a sinner. I'm saying all are sinners. I am a sinner. You are a sinner. Everybody is a sinner. And the Bible says for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means our sins have not only separated us from God, but our our sins will never allow us to have a right standing or a right relationship with God, the God who created all mankind, the God who wants to have that relationship with you and me. To remedy this hopeless situation of the fallen condition of mankind, Jesus Christ came into this world. You see, he is God manifest in the flesh. He was born of a virgin without sin. He lived a sinless life, a holy and an upright life. And he fulfilled the whole law that God had given in this book for man to keep. That law which is written upon your conscience, upon your heart. That, that, that law which tells you deep inside, that little voice which tells you what is right and wrong, which you are unable to follow. He was able to follow not only that inner uh, law written upon the heart, but the law that is written in the book. He kept it all. He fulfilled it because he was holy, righteous and sinless. And as a holy son of God who became man, he went to the cross to die for man, to die for you and for me. And when he hung there upon the cross, he shed his blood as a payment for our sins, as a penalty for our sins. He took the punishment that is due to you and me upon himself. Because you see, all our sins were laid upon him. And he paid the punishment for our sins. Why did he do that? Because the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God didn't do it. So that he would get something back in return. He did it because he loves you. He did it because he created you. This is what the Bible says. God did not want you 
to die in your sins and go to hell. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. At that judgment you will be declared guilty because of your sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And that is just not physical death. But the Bible talks about a lake of fire which is called the second death where the souls of those who have died without their sins being washed in the blood of Jesus Christ would go and burn forever and ever. God doesn't want you to go there. God wants you to be saved from that terrible uh, lake of fire and that's why he sent his son to die on the cross and to shed his blood for your sins. He, was buried, he died, he was buried and he rose up again the third day and the Bible says that if you believe this message that God has for you and if you believe that Jesus Christ has done all this for you, you will be saved, you will be converted. Converted to what? Not from one religion to another. Don't at all be under the impression that we are trying to convert people from one religion to another. It's not that. It's not an outward conversion. It's not an outward profession. Okay, today, till today I believed in this religion. From today onwards, I'm going to believe in Christianity. No, that's not what we are talking about. We are talking about believing in a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. Every religion on this earth tells you what to do, right? What is good, what is wrong. But that's not the message of the Bible. The Bible's message is this, that God became man and died on the cross and shed his blood on that cross for your sins. He was buried and he rose up again. And if you believe it, you will be saved. That is the message of the Bible. It's not about a set of rules, do's and don'ts. It's about a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's whom we preach. We preach Christ crucified. That's our message. You believe it? If you like, you don't. If you think that we are speaking a bunch of nonsense. But you can never say that we are trying to force you into doing anything because we cannot force you into believing anything. You either believe it or you don't. It's in your hands. My prayer is that you would believe this message, that you would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, <coughs> But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. If you believe Jesus died for your sins, paid the penalty for your sins, that he shed his blood to make atonement for your sins, to make payment for your sins, to please God because you have offended him, and that he died and he rose up again, you will be saved. That's all you need to do. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's all. You see, the thing is faith in what Jesus Christ has done. Faith in a person. Not in your own works, not in your own good deeds, not in your own efforts to be a good person. But leaving aside all those things, you trust in Jesus Christ who has done everything for you and you just receive what he has done for you by faith that's our message I know that those who hate Jesus Christ will try and find fault even with this explanation that I've given we cannot help it that's what they've been doing for the past 2000 years 2000 years you read history you will know that but my prayer is that you will trust Jesus Christ as your Savior right now and be saved. And if you would like to know more about Jesus Christ or how to get saved, then you can write to us and we will be happy to help you with it. Now, the Lord willing, we will continue this Bible study on the latter times. Uh, I thought we would be able to finish the whole thing today, but we could not. But the Lord willing, we will finish it. Uh, in the next live Bible study that we are going to have and then we are going to look at uh, the characteristics of the seven church periods that are found in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Thank you very much. The Lord bless you.